What's up, biology students? It's me again. Today's video is about chemical reactions and how these important molecules called enzymes help to control the rate at which these chemical reactions play out inside of our cells. During a physical change, the appearance of a substance may change, but the substance itself does not. When you tear a piece of paper, it's still paper, it just looks different. When an ice cube melts, you still have water, it's just liquid and not solid. And when you chop a piece of wood, you change its appearance, but you don't change the fact that it is still wood. But during a chemical reaction, the atoms that make up a substance break their bonds and form new bonds with different atoms to create totally new substances. For example, if we burn that piece of wood we just chopped, we change it into something that's not wood anymore. Instead, we have smoke and ash, carbon dioxide, and water vapor, but not wood, and there is no way to get that piece of wood back again. That's what a chemical reaction is. It's the atoms that make up a substance getting rearranged to form new substances. However, all the atoms that made that piece of wood still exist. They just exist as part of new molecules that weren't present before this piece of wood was burned. None of those atoms were destroyed during this chemical change, and as a result, we would say that matter was conserved. And the mass of all the stuff that we had at the beginning is the same as the mass of all the stuff we are left with at the end. Energy is also conserved. As that tree was growing, it was absorbing the sun's energy in order to conduct photosynthesis. This same energy is released as heat when we burn the wood. This concept is the law of conservation of matter and energy, and it applies to both physical and chemical changes. Here we see a simple example to illustrate how matter is conserved during a chemical reaction. Suppose that each ball represents an atom, and the letter tells us what kind of atom we have. In all these cases, you should notice that we end with exactly the same number and kinds of atoms that we started with. These atoms, however, have been rearranged and recombined to form new molecules. Take this last row, for example. We start with four atoms, A, B, C, and D, and we end with four atoms, A, B, C, and D. However, these two molecules didn't exist before this reaction, and likewise, these two molecules no longer exist after this reaction. Atoms were rearranged, and we produced new substances, but if we look at the mass of these, and compared it to the mass of these, we would find these masses to be equal. Burning wood is an example of a combustion reaction. This slide depicts a similar reaction, the combustion of methane, which involves much simpler molecules than the combustion of wood. Methane is a form of natural gas, like propane, and is highly flammable. In the presence of oxygen, and enough energy to start this reaction, maybe something like a spark or a flame, one methane molecule will react with two oxygen gas molecules to form one molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. We call the methane and the oxygen gas molecules we started with reactants because they are the molecules that react with one another, and we call this carbon dioxide and these water molecules products because they are what is produced during this reaction. Compare the atoms we start with and the atoms we end with, and we find them to be exactly the same, both in type and in numbers. They have, however, been rearranged to form new substances. This reaction also releases a lot of energy in the form of heat and light, energy that has been stored in the chemical bonds of the methane molecule itself. All chemical reactions require some input of energy in order to get started, and this energy is called the activation energy. In each of these graphs here, this big hump in the middle represents that activation energy. A reaction won't begin until enough energy is present to get the molecules involved over this hump. Kind of like rolling a ball up a hill. If we roll it fast enough, if we put enough energy in, the ball will easily make it to the top of the hill and be able to roll down the other side. If we roll the ball slower, it may not make it to the top of the hill and it may just roll back down by our feet. For our combustion example, the activation energy came in the form of a spark or a flame, and that energy was sufficient to get over the hill and start the reaction. Once a reaction gets going, it either absorbs energy from the environment or releases energy into the environment. The fireworks depicted here are an example of a chemical reaction that releases energy, quite vividly in this case. 
In this first graph, we see the energy involved in an energy absorbing or endothermic reaction. The reactants we start with have very little energy of their own. The products on the other side of this hump have more energy. Since energy is always conserved, that means the difference in energy between the reactants and the products had to come from somewhere, and in this case, that means that it came from the environment in which this reaction is taking place. An example of a reaction like this is photosynthesis, which is actually a series of chemical reactions. The reactants of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water, have very little energy of their own. But the products of photosynthesis, simple carbohydrates and oxygen gas, contain a lot more energy. This energy came from the sun, and the plants are essentially absorbing and packaging the sun's energy into the molecules themselves. Another example of an energy absorbing reaction is the one that occurs inside of an instant ice pack. When you break the pouch inside of an instant ice pack, two substances mix together, react, and absorb energy from their environment in order to keep the reaction going. This feels cold to us because the reaction is literally sucking the heat energy out of our body in order to push this chemical reaction forward. Combustion, like we just talked about, is an example of a reaction that releases energy, an exothermic reaction, and this kind of chemical reaction is depicted in this second graph. In this case, the reactants we start with contain more energy than the products we end with, and this difference in energy is released into the environment. In the case of combustion, we sense that release of energy as heat and light. Another example of an energy-releasing reaction is cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is actually very similar to a combustion reaction. In both cases, a carbon-based molecule reacts with oxygen, releasing energy and producing carbon dioxide and water. During cellular respiration, cells produce ATP during a series of reactions that release the energy stored in those simple carbohydrates I mentioned earlier, the ones that are produced during photosynthesis. Inside of our cells, protein molecules called enzymes help us to regulate the chemical reactions that support life. Enzymes act as biological catalysts, speeding up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy required for that reaction to start. In this graph, we can see this illustrated to us. The blue line represents the progression of a chemical reaction that occurs without any enzymes around to catalyze this reaction. This high point on the graph represents the activation energy required to convert the reactants into products. With an enzyme present, this high point is much lower, meaning the reaction requires much less energy in order to progress. Enzymes work by providing a location for a specific chemical reaction to occur. The reactants of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction are called substrates and these substrates bind to the active site of an enzyme molecule. These pieces fit together like a lock and key, and this is why most enzymes only catalyze one particular chemical reaction. This combination of enzyme and substrates is called an enzyme-substrate complex, and once the reaction is complete, the products are released and the enzyme is ready to catalyze another reaction. Enzymes are sensitive to changes in both temperature and pH, and large fluctuations in these can affect how well our enzymes function, or even whether they are able to function at all. The shape of an enzyme is what allows it to bond with a particular substrate in order to catalyze a chemical reaction. But large changes in temperature and pH can alter the shape of an enzyme, and may prevent that enzyme from being able to function. This is kind of like altering the internal structure of a lock. Once you do that, the key won't fit anymore. In proteins, this change in shape is called denaturing, and is actually what happens when you cook an egg. The egg whites only become white when cooked, and this change in appearance and texture is due to the denaturing of proteins found in eggs. Enzymes help our cells to both build and break down important biological molecules. When small molecules, or monomers, combine to form large molecules, or polymers, this is called a dehydration synthesis reaction. We call it dehydration because water is produced as a byproduct, as though water was removed from these smaller molecules in order to combine them. 
So the name basically means that we are synthesizing a polymer by removing a water molecule. This kind of reaction absorbs energy, and this energy is then stored in the chemical bonds of that large molecule that is produced. Dehydration synthesis is what occurs when combining glucose molecules to make starch or glycogen, when combining nucleotides to make DNA, when attaching fatty acid chains to a glycerol molecule in order to make lipids, and when combining amino acids to build a polypeptide, which is what we see happening here in this model. Enzymes help to catalyze these kinds of reactions. In this model, the substrates are these two amino acid monomers. In order to form a bond between these two amino acids, the ingredients for a water molecule must be removed. That's the dehydration part. And then a new peptide bond is formed in place of the atoms that were removed, and our polypeptide has been synthesized. In order to make that happen, energy is absorbed, making this an endothermic reaction. When the opposite process occurs, when large molecules are broken down into smaller molecules, this is called hydrolysis. Hydro means water, and lysis means to split. So this reaction is basically like splitting a molecule apart using water. This kind of reaction releases energy, so that makes it exothermic. In our bodies, some of the energy that is released during these kinds of reactions, during our metabolism, is the heat that keeps our bodies warm, and this excess heat helps us to maintain homeostasis. This is what it means to be warm-blooded. Our metabolisms are working fast enough that we produce enough of our own internal heat to keep us warm and keep our internal temperature stable. The same is not true of reptiles and amphibians, who metabolize much slower and who rely on external sources of heat to keep them warm and maintain homeostasis. This model depicts an example of a hydrolysis reaction, in which a larger molecule, a polymer, is broken down into smaller molecules, or monomers. Sucrose is our substrate in this case, and when water is added, sucrose is split apart into a molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose. Adding water, that's the hydro part of hydrolysis, and splitting a big molecule, well, that's the lysis part of hydrolysis. This kind of reaction is exothermic, meaning it releases energy. Life runs on chemical reactions. There are literally thousands of chemical reactions occurring inside your cells right now, many of which are being regulated by enzymes. Understanding these enzymes and the chemical reactions they catalyze is key to understanding life itself. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks for watching, everyone.